morning. Welcome to Walnut Grove Christian Church like never before. Hey, take a second, since we're all here together, to say hi to the other people in the room. All right, take a second, greet each other. You guys love greeting, so here's your chance. And while you're, you're saying hello, keep in mind we have a great opportunity this week for you to get into scripture with a reading plan. Great opportunity for you to be able to give, to meet some tangible needs, whether of uh, students, international students who are still in Charleston who need food or through a food pantry or for Standing Stone. And we also have a chance for you to engage through a prayer time. And so we have the conference call in there, dial the one, and you get to share life with other people in a time of isolation. So this morning, here we are, Palm Sunday. And I want you to think back to 2011. Before Harry met Megan, the world went a little nuts. Maybe you were one of these people who went a little crazy for William marrying Kate Middleton. Now, I know we fought a war for independence about 243 years ago. And yet still, millions of Americans are fans of the royals. Not the Kansas City Royals either, right? The, the British Royals, the monarchy, the crown. I know friends, they just keep binging the crown on Netflix over and over and over again. And recently, I don't ask why, I watched on, Netflix, on YouTube a video of the big day between William and Kate. And in the video, hundreds of thousands of adoring British subjects were allowed on the grounds of Buckingham Palace. They were ushered in by riot police in the full get-up and they were excited because this was their opportunity. After hours of waiting in the dreary British weather, they got to stand on the grounds and look up and see Kate and William on the royal balcony dressed to the nines. Now on that day, full of festivities, the people got to see only a fraction or a glimpse of all that took place. And yet still they were crying, they were gasping with anticipation, they were shoulder to shoulder fueled by the excitement of seeing their future king. And as I watched, I wondered, as Palm Sunday neared, if the British crowd was anything like the Jewish crowd. I wondered if the air of excitement and vigor and passion that I saw in the video was anything like the Jewish crowd, as they eagerly anticipated and welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem on a day that we call the triumphant entry. See, we've been in a sermon series called Living Through Easter. And we remember that while Sin City's campaign is that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, that God's campaign to the world is better because it tells us that what happened on Easter was never meant to stay on Easter. And as we watched this series unfold, we found Jesus brought peace to people living in chaos, forgiveness to those of us who falter, empathy to those living in isolation. And yet today, as we watch from the triumphant entry almost all the way up to the point of resurrection, we find that the crowd who thought they saw everything from that day saw only a fraction, a glimpse of what was going on. And as Easter approached, the disciples were certain they understood that this was the triumphant entry. What they didn't know at the time was it would feel soon enough like a dead end. Jump in with me to Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 37. Here's a picture of the triumphant entry. When Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, so this would have been the ridge across the Kidron Valley, um, opposite of the temple. There is this kind of greeting place, this meeting place where the crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen from Jesus. They cried out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. For the disciples, think about this. This was a good day. This was the day they got to come in on the coattails of Jesus. They got to walk on his palm branches meant for him. They got to hear and bask in the adulation and the shouts of praise for all the miracles that Jesus had done. Being in the first century entourage rocked. In fact, John and James, two of Jesus' disciples, had prepared for this moment with their mama 
They had gone to Jesus with the idea of reigning. They liked the idea of sitting near Jesus in all his power, and they asked for assigned seats in heaven, in the coming kingdom. And yet, less than a week later, the smooth entry into Jerusalem, being part of the the best entourage of the first century, would look more like a trap than a triumph, when there seemed like there would be no way out. See, John chapter 20 tells us as the days progress where the disciples find themselves. When the disciples were together, first day of the e- first evening of the week, doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. So the disciples living through Jesus' arrest, living through the crucifixion alone at this point, saw Jesus brutally pinned to a tree. They saw themselves locked away in an upper room. If the Roman authorities could do that to Jesus, the one who had the authority, the answers, the power, and the presence, what could they do to the disciples who lacked all of that? They felt trapped living through the crucifixion. Speaking of being trapped, Hector Tobar, in his book, Deep Down Dark, tells the story of 33 Chilean miners who were actually trapped below the earth, 2,000 feet below for 69 days. You probably saw something about this when all the world was focused on the rescue effort. And yet down below in the dark, with almost no food, cut off from the rest of the world, they were pretty certain that they were staring face to face with death. And as they took stock of their life, they began to realize that they had some regrets, some things they wished they could have done different, some areas of their life that they saw now as shortcomings. And so somebody in response asked Jose Enriquez, a Christian, if he would pray for the group. He finally accepted the invitation. He got down on his knees and some of the other men joined him and he began to talk to God. We aren't the best men, Lord, but have pity on us. And then he did something that you probably wouldn't like if you were in a prayer circle with them or a prayer group, he got more specific. He said, Victor Sagavia knows that he drinks too much. Victor Zamora is too quick to anger. Pedro Cortez thinks that he's been a poor father to his daughter. And yet strangely, in the midst of the deep down dark, these men didn't object to those prayers. In fact, each day as they ate their meager meal, they heard a brief homily or message, and then they hit their knees again in prayer. God, forgive me for my violent outbursts that I unleashed on my wife and son, one would pray. God, forgive me for abusing the temple of my body with drugs, another laid out. They confessed again and again and again to their sins. I'm sorry that I raised my voice with my brother. I'm sorry I didn't help get water. See, being in the deep, down, dark allowed these men to see themselves like they had never seen themselves before. And while they seemed to be trapped down below, they didn't know that above the surface, one of the greatest rescue missions in human history was unfolding. That would bring people together from around the world, regardless of nation, some of the most innovative and creative people, some of the best technology, prayers and petitions from around the world for their safety, for their lives. See, it's a lot like the pit the disciples were in. In the midst of their deep down dark, they thought nothing was going on. They thought they were staring eye to eye with death. But what they didn't know is that above the surface, God was working. So today, maybe you find yourself in the deep down dark. Maybe you feel overwhelmed by all the things going on in our worlds, all of the news stories, all of the the frustration, all of the worries about what about my job? What about my finances? What about my health? And yet you need to know in the deep down dark that God promises to work above the surface. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, he tells us that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purposes. So you may not feel it in the deep down dark. You may not see it in the deep down dark. But it's going on. See, the beauty is that the disciples couldn't see it at the time. They saw a triumphant entry, 
and miss that it would feel soon enough like a dead end. But that's not the only thing they missed. As Jesus walked into Jerusalem, they knew that it was a crowning of a king. What they missed was it was also a selecting of a sacrifice. Turn with me to Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 8. Another version of the triumphant entry. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the field, right? Palm Sunday, right? These branches lay down for Jesus. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Luke's version tells us this is the coming of a king who bears the name of the Lord. And they yell at this word Hosanna, which is a word from Psalm 118, verse 26, a messianic term that captures the urgency, the necessity from the people. God, save us, it means, or deliver us. Some even add in in their translation, save us now, deliver us now. And they see this as a sign that Jesus has come, the line of David as the forever king who would bring back the golden era that they longed for, that they had heard about, that their father's father's father had longed for and and talked about glowingly, part of their history, that they wanted to be a current reality. And so they walked on cloaks Jesus rode in on or walked on branches, all signs of his kingship. He rode in fulfilling Zachariah's promise on a, a donkey, sign of a king that was coming, right? They got this. This was the crowning of a king, but what they missed, what they couldn't see in the moment in the adulation was that this was a selection of a sacrifice too. So you go back with me to Exodus chapter 12, verse three, and Moses told the people who were slaves in Egypt about to leave on the Exodus on the 10th day, mark that, on the 10th day of the month, Each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Okay, so you select the lamb on the 10th, sacrifice it at twilight on the 14th. Maybe this is a little bit like your Thanksgiving ritual. You go to the store one day, And you figure out, okay, we need a a turkey that's 25 pounds of meat or 50 pound turkey. And then on Thanksgiving, you cook it and you eat it. And so Moses tells them, right, on the 10th, select your lamb. On the 14th, sacrifice it. What would be their their Passover. See, fast forward, though, 1,500 years to Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 1 tells us that the day before the 10th, the 9th, that Jesus was in Bethany, a city just about two miles east of Jerusalem where Lazarus had been raised. And then in John chapter 12, verse 12, we're told that the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Now, I know I throw in some verse at you, but get this, the next day was the 10th. It was the day where the people were meant to travel the road to find the lamb that they were going to sacrifice on the 14th. And as the roads were crowded with people, as Jesus makes his triumphant entry, Jesus is telling the world, here I am, I've come for the lamb selection ceremony. I am your lamb. The disciples thought they were part of a crowning when actually They were living through a selection ceremony for the Lamb of God. They had glimpses of this. They didn't fully understand. But Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, Abraham had told Isaac, God will provide the sacrifice. Or they had the words of John the Baptist, who said, here's Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Later, it would be obvious. But only after they moved from living through the crucifixion to living through Easter, would they be able to see it? Peter would see it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. John, only after, would see it in Revelation 20 times or more, referring to Christ as the lamb. Then I saw the lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. Or they overcame by the blood of the lamb. 
See, living through the crucifixion, they couldn't see the full significance of what was coming. Not yet. They couldn't embrace the full meaning of that sacrifice. Reminds me of a story from, I don't know, 40 years ago. A 14-foot bronze cross was stolen from a cemetery in Little Rock, Arkansas. And it had stood at the entrance of this cemetery for, for more than 50 years. It was put up in the 30s. Uh, a bishop in the Catholic Church had arranged for it to be put up. And for 50 years, it stood proudly, welcoming people into the cemetery. Until some thieves decided that they liked the idea of making a quick buck off that cross. And so in the middle of the night, they came with a crew. They took it down, put it in the back of a pickup truck. And the police think that they cut it up into scraps. And they made probably about, I don't know, 450 bucks. Right? They'd cashed in on the cross. What they didn't know was in the 1930s, when it had been put up, it had been valued at $10,000. And each year had built in value. See, they made pocket change when they were looking at something that was immensely valuable. And yet they had undervalued. They hadn't fully seen the significance of the cross. See, today, though, as we get to live through Easter, we get a chance to see what Jesus did as he traded in the full brilliance of his righteousness to eclipse our unrighteousness. As Jesus came as this God-man who could bridge the gap, bridge the divide between heaven and earth like no one else could. He would be the one who would come to answer the calls of those people so long ago on the triumphant entry. Hosanna! Deliver us! And Jesus said, okay, I will. Hosanna! Save us. And Jesus says, I've come to save you. See, but the crowd on that day, that triumphant entry on Palm Sunday, didn't see all that was going on. See, they thought Jesus' arrival meant that they were going to get a new life. What they didn't see is that Jesus was bringing eternal life. Jump with me to Matthew chapter 21, starting verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. All right, so I want you to think about that word. Maybe some of you have stirred butter. Maybe you've seen news stories hit the public and all of a sudden it's all people could talk about, all the different angles, kind of like this coronavirus, right? It's constantly being stirred around and around and around. And so Jesus' arrival stirs up the city. And people ask the question, who is this? Great question. The crowds gave one answer. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So as Kevin Miller wrote, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, everyone knew a regime change was coming. That this was the day that God's people had been praying for. They had been under the boot of Rome. They had been reduced to nothing more than a puppet state. They had no king because Rome wouldn't allow it. They had a high priest, but the ceremonial robes were locked away in a guard tower. So Jesus, for most people, represented new life. For some, he was the the revolutionary who would bring a golden era. For the disciples, the power train, right, to the place of prominence and significance. Everyone could see in Jesus that they were going to get something new. But what they missed was that Jesus was bringing something eternal. And while we can look at the cross and we say, thank you, God. Right? Maybe you sometimes just look at the cross and you say, thank you, God. How could you do that for me? Thank you, God. The disciples looked at the same cross and they said, thanks a lot. Because living through the crucifixion meant that this was their expectations crashing and burning before their eyes. Peter, James, John, the fishermen of the group could have gone back to the boats. Matthew, Levi, maybe could have gone back to his government job. Simon, the zealot, maybe back to his ill-fated overthrow of the Roman government. And yet the new life they thought they needed. The Roman enemies they thought had to be defeated. All the demands that they placed on Jesus were actually masking the eternal life that they couldn't live without. 
See, Jesus had to let them down. He had to break their expectations. He let them down as he was lifted up. But in lifting himself up on the cross, he was actually lifting humanity with him. It's been said wisely that the crowds were clueless. They saw a glimpse. They saw a fraction of what unfolded. But they never got it. They shouted praises and Jesus wept. They looked for a warrior king riding a white stallion. And they got a carpenter riding on a donkey. They wanted hype. They got a healer. They wanted a prophet. They got the one who fulfilled prophecy. They wanted a scepter. They got a savior. They got nothing they asked for and everything they needed. Only they didn't get it. They were clueless. Jesus was the only one who really knew what was happening on the first Palm Sunday. And here's the reality. It's easy for us to be like those people in the streets watching Jesus' triumphant entry. We think we, we know what's going on. We know, think we know why we've come to Jesus, what we expect to get. And sometimes Jesus has come to give us something entirely different. And we see this play out. We have a bad week at work and we say, God, uh, what's going on? The world turns in a direction we didn't ask for. And we say, dude, big guy in heaven, what's, what's going on? How could you let this happen to me? We say, God, I, I prayed for protection and peace. Why are you allowing a world to feel like the Wild West? We work our two jobs and we wonder why our home life suffers or our kids have to act up at school. And we say, man, what teachers to blame? So Jesus has come to our town. He's come into our homes. This morning, he's he's come into your home through his word. And he wants to help us. He wants to transform us. But the question is, do we recognize him for who he truly is? See, we take his name. Sometimes we call ourselves his disciples. But until we really let ourselves see the world as Jesus saw the world, until we answer the call, until we step out of our interest and begin to see his interest, we never really get what he's calling us to do. See, it's amazing. John chapter one, verse 14 says that Jesus was willing to come and pitch a tent in humanity. Remember that word that was with God and was God became flesh and made its dwelling among us, dwelling literally to tabernacle, to put up a tent. Jesus was willing to become human and to camp with us. And I started to think about the difference between a tent camping and a motorhome. See, in high school, a friend of mine got his grandparents' motorhome, and we took it out camping. Now, we had a a dish on top of the satellite. We brought the TV, the PS4. We brought all the things we would need to use the kitchen, the bathroom, the shower. We slept on the different beds that were all part of this RV. And so we drove the motorhome to the concrete slab. We plugged in all of the different needs that we had. The water line, the sewer line, the electricity. And we didn't have to worry about the dirt. We had a fire, but we didn't have to really worry about the smoke. There was no drudgery of having to walk down to a stream to get water. And sometimes with the motorhome, we can drive to a new place. We can set up in a new surrounding but our newness goes unnoticed because we've carried everything from home to the new setting. And too often the same thing happens with Christianity, the tent versus the motor home. It happens with Christ. We hear him call us to surrender. Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And we say, okay, Jesus, tell me where you're at. And he says, man, I'm right here. And so we drive our motor home as close to Jesus as possible. And we open the blinds and we're putting our face to the window. We say, Jesus, hi, Jesus, I'm right here. You're right there. This is great. We're together. But in truth, he calls us out of the motor home and into the wild, into a life that follows him, into a life that isn't exactly like we expected where we allow our expectations to die so that his expectations for us can thrive. See, today, what would it look like for you to step out of your expectations, to step out of the motorhome, 
to not settle just for a glimpse of Jesus or just a fraction of the story, but to begin to see Jesus for who he truly is, the God-man who's come to redeem humanity, to transform you here and into the eternal life that's coming. To not just to settle, not just to go with a name, not just to be a nominal Christian, but instead to embrace a life that goes beyond just living through the crucifixion and like the disciples begins to live through Easter. We go beyond a glimpse. So today I need you to know, I want you to take this idea away from you. We're probably not going to be able to meet for Easter. But that's okay. Because we need to learn the lesson that Easter is not a holiday. Easter is not a date on the calendar. Easter is a way of life. Easter is a relationship with the risen Savior. Easter can be lived out today if you're ready. Jesus invites you to come and to embrace him, to follow him, to declare him Lord and Savior, and then to begin to grow into his likeness. And so at this time, I'd encourage you, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this feels a little weird with the digital format, but, but why not, man? Why not just accept him now as God has pulled away all the other things that we could worship and has showed himself in the one that remains stable, consistent, the God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. At this time, I'd love for you to reach out to me if you're ready to accept Christ. Maybe you're not even part of Walnut Grove, but you're just watching this video through a watch party. Feel free to just drop us a message. And if you're, you're part of a group right now, maybe you're worshiping with your family, let me encourage you on this Sunday morning to grab the discussion questions that we sent out that allow you just to go a little bit deeper, to think a little bit more fully about how this sermon applies to your life. And to tap into some of the resources that we've prepared you for. Remember the, the spiritual opportunities, the communal opportunities, and the, the biblical opportunities to really use this time to go deeper. And to begin to bring Easter to bear in the lives of your family, in your life, and in the lives of your neighbors. All right, guys, God bless you. Look forward to talking down below.
I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I